and I'm very, very delighted to be here and to talk to such an interesting, interesting mi mix of people, the people I've met so far, all interesting people from such a wide range, and it's very refreshing for me. I'm interested, as you can see, in a lot of things, but I'm not going to talk about... Uh, I've got a show on at the moment, which we've just done in the Edinburgh Festival, not for the festival, but one of the fringe events. It's called A Lady is Not a Gent. It's about Duchamp, St Duchamp stole the urinal from a wonderful German artist, a woman artist called Baroness, Freda von F Baroness, Baroness Elsa von Freytag Loringhoven. And uh, we tell the story of this, and there's going to be a book next year, but I'm not going to talk about that. But that shows you that con art, conceptual art, began in 1950, not 1917. And it is a con, and it is based on a con. So all this is going to, all that nonsense, I hope, will just disappear. Uh, I'm, uh, as I say, I, the reason I'm here partly is because I've been writing a book with Raymond Tallis, uh, well, editing sort of compiling a book out of his writings, but I'm not going to talk about that. That's called The Purpose of Art today. And I've also been working on theories for a new book, I mean, uh, which I'll talk about a bit later, uh, about a new theories about Stonehenge uh, being a raised platform, a mecca on stilts. But this is something I'm not going to talk about either. Uh, I, I'm interested in a lot of things which are not supposed to be. Uh, but I couldn't care less what people think, I just follow my nose. And when I was asked to speak here, it was the theme of self-portraiture, and I said, well, that's an interesting subject. So I want to talk to you about what interests me about self-portraiture, so you have to forgive me from, from being this butterfly coming to this field. Uh, and I want to really talk about... Uh, uh, I want to talk about why, why uh, self-portraiture is a... Uh, be, uh, before our horrible selfie culture, which isn't really self-portraiture at all, but I want to talk about why self-portraiture is a purely Western Christian phenomenon. And I want to uh, just uh, tease that out a bit. And then I want to look at uh, identity portraiture in non-Western cultures, very briefly. And then I want to come back and say where self-portraiture is different from portraiture and what that could mean, perhaps, for contemporary creativity. So it's a big subject, uh, and I've got 20 minutes, so I better get on with it. Uh, anyway, I'm going to show you six slides, and I'm going to go backwards and forwards between them, only six slides for this talk, and, uh, uh, and I hope it will make sense. But the technology it might not quite me. I might have to skip some things. Anyway. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, Dürer's self-portrait, in, uh, in painted in 1500 when he was 28, in what he said, permanent colours. Uh, this, uh, I, I just want to wipe away contemporary culture for you. This is not celebrity culture, that horrible perversion of sort of... Uh, sort of horrible, horrible uh, perversion of egalitarianism. Uh, it has nothing to do with celebrity culture. Jura would be disqualified from being a celebrity in our modern age for three reasons. One is because he was immensely talented. Two is was because he works fantastically hard on developing his talents. And three, because he has something to say. So <laughs> he's uh, not a celebrity. So let's forget all that. The other thing I want you to, but this is usually, this painting is usually written about, about the emergence of the artist as an individual genius. The emergence of great named artists. This is a perfect example of that. I think that's also a total misreading of this painting. And I want to talk about various readings as we go through this talk, which I hope will change your view of it. I think this painting is actually a painting of profound humility. And I hope the word humility is already making you begin to look at this painting slightly differently, looking at the mouth and the eyes and the whole gesture of it. It's difficult for us in our post-Darwinian times to uh, sort of imagine what it was like when people believed, as Western Christian did, not Eastern Christian people, but Western Roman Christian people, believed that God not only made us in his image, made men in his image, I'm not going to talk about women in this talk, I hope you won't think I have anything against women, but it's just the way portraiture works, as you'll see, or the history of portraiture works. The, um, uh, God made man, man, in his image, and he also sent his son to earth, and his son was himself manifest in human flesh. 
Therefore, when you looked at you, when a man looks at himself, he was looking partly at his creator. And that is what Dürer is trying to paint. He's not painting himself arrogantly as a creative genius on a level with Christ, but he is saying, yes, the creativity that I have is God-given, and it's the God-like part of me. His hand is not a hand of gesture of blessing. It's turned into himself. It's holding, perhaps, I'm not sure what that fur is, but I should know, really, but perhaps clutching the fur, which might be the sable, which is the brush, which he might have used to paint it. But he's saying, look, what, look, here I am. It was painted in 1500. This is extremely important because 1500 was the year, another millennial year, when people thought Christ would return. They'd been waiting for one and a half thousand years. There was tremendous disappointment after the first million of thousand. Then they realized, the church realized they were in for a long run and started to build in stone. Uh, but in 1500, there was a real th thought that Christ could return. And he's painted himself saying, look, here I am. If you come back, I have not hid my light under a bushel. <laughs> I have not wasted my God-given talents. I have not denied the, 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 the God Ness in that you have given in myself, and that's what the painting is about. So it's a painting of tremendous humility and tremendous praise. And Ruskin said, "All art is praise," and it's still one of the most wonderful comments about art. But uh, his, it's also a dark painting, and it's one of the first really dark paintings in the world. And it's a dark background, and there's also darkness in the center, in the pits of his eyes. There's a darkness about his paint, this painting, which is new. Uh, I just... And, and Giuro, with, a, with the instinct of genius, was feeling that uh, at the beginning of the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was... The Enlightenment produced the darkest art the world has ever seen. The Enlightenment was a, was a period of spiritual darkening. And Dürer is beginning to paint it. And, the, and uh, it, it's only see, um, uh, 92 when Columbus sailed around the world and came back. And we realized the world was a sphere. As you know, the, the Pope commissioned Michelangelo to paint his ceiling because they had to, the Roman Catholic Church, had to reassert that heaven was above us. If, if, if uh, the world was a sphere, where was heaven? And was God all around us? He couldn't be beneath us. <laughs> so the word Baroque means a, a, a misshapen pearl. It, it's misshapen because this universe is, is a pearl, but it's misshapen because there's a bulge on top for heaven. <laughs> and, but Dürer was beginning to sense this whole disruption that was coming. Leonardo did in his own way. And, but when, he saw, when, when uh, Dürer saw the treasures brought back in, 18, in 1520 uh, from, the, the, from Central America, he said, these are more miraculous, more wonderful to me than any miracle. He was being challenged. And he's painting, he's painting his faith and the challenge of his faith. And that's where self-portrait, that's the beginning of self-portraiture in the European tradition because you are painting your maker. And, it, uh, and you can see it here, obviously, much further into the Enlightenment, a much, much greater darkness. Uh, this is 150 years later. This is 1659. Uh, Rembrandt's painting painted this in, when he was 53. Uh, just uh, a couple of years after, he was declared bankrupt and had lost everything. And, but he painted a tenth of his oeuvre in our self-portraits. Now, that wasn't because he was trying to promote himself. He did sell them. Uh, it wasn't only because he was trying to promote his fame. He knew he was good. Uh, but also because he was fascinated by himself. And he was fascinated by himself, I suggest, for the same reason that Dürer was. Because he was partly, God was in him. He could see God in himself. And, but could he? There is increasing doubt. Here, here is an old man who's lost everything, ruined financially, in many ways socially disgraced. He's put that hat on. He often, in the end of his life, had a white hat, the painter's white hat, smocked, show he was working. He's put the dark, that dark hat on as a, as a businessman, might be a merchant, but 
Uh, he's done it because it's a dark halo, I think. But the whole painting is dark. And there's tremendous darkness in those eyes and tremendous doubt. Uh, just, uh, um, in, in, uh, uh, just, I think, three years before, Spinoza was excommunicated. And uh, uh, Rembrandt knew the, the Dutch Jewish, the Jewish com community in Amsterdam. Spinoza was just being excommunicated by the, in the synagogue. Uh, and as they read out the indictment against him, they didn't specify why, but they, but they said basically they, because he said that he doubted whether the soul was eternal and he doubted whether God was beneficent, but they read out his excommunication and as they did it, they, they, they snuffed out each candle in the synagogue one by one. So at the end of the excommunication, the synagogue and the congregation were in total darkness. It's the most symbolic action of the Enlightenment, in a way, you know, when it's really only getting really going because Galileo has already turned his telescope on the moon and found it was a lump of solid rock. And here is Rembrandt, a god made, um, um, uh, a, an image of God made, uh, made in man or man made God. Here is. Uh, Rembrandt ready to face his maker as himself and he's looking at himself ready to face his maker. I want now to, this is as you can see a very quick journey through <laughs> the Enlightenment but I want to look at this post-Darwinian painting by, by Van Gogh. This is the end of the Enlightenment and Van Gogh's journey really is an extraordinary journey against spiritual darkening. You can interpret his work and his painting as an amazing burst of a only a decade of fantastic, endless burst of color against the Enlightenment, against a material view of the world. He was fantastically inspired by the Japanese a Japanese prince when they came to Europe. Jap Japan had closed its doors to the European Enlightenment. That's effectively what they did. They closed its, its, its doors totally for 250 years. They were forced to open in 1856. And, the, and, the art, and, and art began to come in. And Van Gogh said, here at last are painters who aren't measuring the distance between the earth and the moon. <laughs> These are painters that are painting what it feels like. Uh, you know, what, what everything means to us to be human. And he's looking at himself, looking at his eyes, and he's painted us, he's painted himself as individual, as a starburst, as a, as a burst of light. And the light is in his eye, and this is a long tradition in, in the history of humanity, about the light that goes out when you die being the light that is starlight. It's the light of your life, and God, the God-giving life, your soul that shines out of your eyes. This was thought, thought to descend from heaven, and Van Gogh is reasserting it. He, also, there's a lot of doubt here, of course, but there's also this huge flaming burst of energy. And when he say he's fascinated by the night, and it's very symbolic of the story I'm telling you about the Enlightenment, he said, when all sounds cease, the voice of God can be heard under the stars. And he's... Uh, anyway, this is the this is what self-portrait was about. The journey, the great self-portraits are the portraits of the Enlightenment, and they are about the journey, uh, the the struggle with uh, materialism and spirituality in people's eyes. At the same time that Van Gogh was was painting this, just a little earlier, the great Swiss. Uh, a cultural historian J Jacob Burkhardt was discovering the Renaissance. Discovered it. <laughs> he worked out what it was, and he. Uh, I need to go back. And he said that the. If I, I simplifying, but as you can see, this is a simplification. This talk. The uh, he was saying that what happened in the Renaissance was that uh, we we grew up. Humanity grew up. They they became adults. They, they, uh, we cease to be children. We cease to be identified by our family. We cease to be identified by a tribe or by, uh, by a race uh, or by religion or by faith. We actually became individuals. We were grown up individually responsible. And that is the birth of the Renaissance. And he said it was a rebirth but because it came from classical Greece and Rome. 
but it still was a birth of individuality. Well, I think he's wrong about this. And, uh, but I'm not blaming him for it, because we now know more, much more about uh, other cultures. He was certainly right about, uh, uh, about it being a rebirth. The, the Greeks were famous at the time, the ancient Greeks were famous for their portraiture. Nothing survives. It is a great tragedy of humanity that we've destroyed so much of our past, so much of our achievements, but we have. Anyway, nothing survives, but a few Roman ones do, and they survive. The painted ones mainly survive in a few in Pompeii, but mainly from this area of, a particular area of Egypt, where they would develop this practice of painting portraits to put in coffins as mummy, on mummies. And I, I couldn't resist, I could have shown some ladies here, I tried to apologize, but I, I haven't. I couldn't resist this one because it was a double burial. Uh, we don't know where a lot of these, this is about 140 uh, AD, uh, and, uh, but it's a double portrait of two brothers thought nobody knows really about them or where it came from. They were ro grave, robbed, uh, grave robbed, it's now in the Cairo Museum. But I just want to show you because uh, with very few strokes, uh, the artist, the art using wax, wax, a wax, wax based paint, uh, these artists have managed to capture personalities in a complete way. Look at the two different faces, you can read their lives. You can read their whole personalities. So the Romans and the Greeks were certainly aware of individuality and what it meant, but so too were other cultures. I would want to go that. This uh, is a, uh, a moche uh, pot. Uh, it's an amazing experience. I recommend if you are in Lima to go to the Larco Museum where all the stores are open and you can walk through that museum and see hundreds of pots. They are all individual, individual portraits of people. That culture was about individuality and uh, that's a portrait uh, and it's actually a jug and they filled it with, we don't know what, but some sort of alcohol and probably the, the maize alcohol they drunk uh, chicha, and they, and they probably drank it, and I think, I fancifully think, because I'm fond of fantasying, uh, they, I think they drank it, uh, these things were not in burials, when they were in burials they'd been used a lot, uh, they were, I think they, 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 they drank uh, uh, liquor out of flasks with like Toby jugs with a face, and as they drank they lifted the face to the stars as where these individuals had come from. But it's a remarkable celebration of individuality, and so is this. And uh, I don't know whether you've been there, but it is absolutely mind-blowing that every one of these faces, I've just shown one slide, just to show these two faces near, but you can see beyond them, every one is individual. Even more so when they were painted, what most of the painting has gone from these things. This was an... Uh, an army of 7,000 individuals, all of them individualized by the artist. This is an extraordinary uh, artistic achievement, a celebration of individu individuality, which you would not expect from what is supposed to be a dictator, what was supposed to be a dictator, but the dictators at that time were not like even Caesar, were not like, you know, the dictators we think, they didn't destroy humanity, they didn't destroy individuality, they separated, celebrated. There, there are eight moles, there are a hundred moles used in the Chimu figures, there are eight moles used here, but they, the Chinese had an idea that there were eight basic shapes of the skull and faces, but every one of them had to be a person, and they had to recognize individuality. So. Uh, I think Joe's, uh, Jacob Burkhardt was wrong to say that the Renaissance was a discovery of individuality. Uh, but what then is this then? Why is this not, uh, why, why is a self-portrait different from a portrait? Uh, I just want to say, well, uh, go back. The, uh, it's the look in the eyes. What are these people looking at? And uh, Dürer has painted himself obviously looking at himself. So what you're seeing here is not just, when you, look at, when you look at this painting, you engage with his look. You see him looking at you, because he's painted him looking at himself. And when you see him looking at, at you, you are actually, amazingly, you suddenly realize, as you're standing in front of this painting, this is in Munich, the, the, you realize that actually you're standing where Dürer stood, looking at himself. You are Dürer looking at Dürer. That is an amazing uh, 
intellectual leap. And it's true of Rembrandt. It's true as Van Gogh, you're looking in their eyes. It's not true of this, but he's looking down, it's one I've chosen. But you're, it's not true of this. Though they're looking at you, they're not actually engaged with you. It, it's being looked at from the outside, and with this, in the same sense, you're, you're looking as an outsider. It's a look of an individual. So what are we looking at here? What is extraordinary about self-portraiture is that it's actually about a communication. It's about the space we share, the consciousness that we share with each other. It's our, my ability to look into your eyes. And, the, and, when we, and, and that is, uh, that's what was discovered in the Renaissance. It isn't the Burkhardtian, it isn't the celebration of the genius, it isn't the celebration of individuality. It's actually a discovery of of a space between us. And, uh, and uh, this insubstantial, I was talking to Ray Tallis about this because uh, one of the wonderful themes about the, uh, the, the Enlightenment is they discover that nothing comes out of the eyes. In Shakespeare, nothing comes out of the eyes. Nothing physical. And, the, and of course, in Islam, the, um, uh, veiled people still, the whole history of the veil is to protect you against the evil eye as if something came out of your eye. Nothing does, nothing physical, nothing can. And it's, anyway, this is another story, but I was saying to Ray, look, but how is it then that we can communicate? How is it? And he said, if nothing comes out of the eye, how can I know what you're thinking when I look at you? How can we be talking? And I said, if it's not material, what is it, you know, this exchange, this communication between us that is there, painted there? And I said to Ray, he said, well, if it doesn't exist, how can it exist? And he said, well, uh, we don't know enough about matter, <laughs> was his reply. Uh, but uh, that's what this, that's what the, I think the, uh, the uh, uh, self-portrait discovered. But what implication does this have for art? And I, I'm sure I've run out of time now. But the um, uh, uh, art today, I think it has uh, two things I'd like to say. One is that, of course, forgetting all this junk that is an art, that is mostly full across the laguna there, uh, 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 none of it's art because it's not communicating, it's not created, it's not, uh, it's not expressing anything. But, the, but wh when we look for art and what is art, and in music or in any art form, the, uh, um, we have to look for individuality now. We have to look for personality and expression. We have to look, it has to come out of an individual's experience of life, otherwise it has no authenticity, I think. Uh, and uh, in, that's what I look for, but I also look for something else. It has to exist within the shared light of our collective consciousness. It has to, it has to have a light. It has to be alive and a light. It has to have light. And I can quote, and I'm probably going to misquote you now, John Burnside, I'm going to misquote. He said, the painter, now let me think, the, cane, the painter cares, not, cares for nothing but the light. Have I got it right? <laughs> it's one of your lines. The painter cares for nothing but the light. And I think that that, and that is true of all the arts. They're, they're trying to find the sphere of illumination that enables us to share what we are communicating to somebody else, as well as express our individuality, as well, of course, as having something to say. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say. I, 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 just before I, I have questions, I just want to say, I was allowed to do a promo. <laughs> I asked Anne if I, because I, I, there's a, I've got a new book here, which has got a lot of these ideas and hundreds more in it, a little book. And I've got some copies which I can sell for, because I'm a pensioner and uh, I need to sell, you know. But anyway, if I give copies away, I find people don't, buy, wrote, don't read them, but if you buy them. So I've got them for 10, 10 euros. It's 8.99 in Britain, but 10 euros. I have some copies I'm happy to sell, but I'm going to give one to Alan because then that means he doesn't have to read it. But that's the end of my promo, the end of my lecture. And so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I probably overspent my time. I wonder if you have any remarks about or any thoughts about the Eastern icon painting tradition. Um, you talk about the self-portrait as some sort of encounter with the divine, perhaps, or the divine in man. And I wonder what you had to say about a tradition of painting which is specifically about instantiating that encounter with the divine. Yeah. Um, this is a big subject. 
Um, the Christianity split off in the Nicene Creed, and the and the uh, the Orthodox side of the Eastern Church uh, didn't be believe that God had been that Jesus was a God, obviously, but he'd been reincarnated in the flesh before the flesh of Adam before the fall. So it's a it's a, a, an extraordinary conceit, really. But they basically said their icon painting is all the same. And the icon painting is a screen, so it's the iconostasis between you and the Holy of Holies. And it's a flat screen. And icon painting basically hasn't changed. It didn't become individualized, it didn't become localized, it didn't become down to earth. It was seen to be a wall uh, that enables you to see heaven. So in a very simplistic terms, that's, that it, 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 it is a very different Christian tradition. Uh, and it's much more to do with Plato, and it's much more, well, there's a lot of things I can say about it, but in, in simplest terms, it's very division. It, it's, the, it's only the Roman church uh, that uh, has, this, has this tremendous problem that says that God manifests himself and that everything, and you can see God not only in yourself, but in nature. And this, of course, opened the door to the Enlightenment, because all the early Enlightenment uh, um, scientists and thinkers were Christian, like Newton, and they were looking at God. They were looking at nature closer to see God, and the more they looked, the you know, the less they could see of Him, and the darker everything became, darker and darker and darker. And the darkness of Enlightenment art is an extraordinary, unique phenomenon in the history of humanity. Thanks very much, Julian. Um, I wasn't sure probably because I missed, uh, missed parts of it, but the continuation from Rembrandt to Van Gogh, and in the way in which you expressed that Dürer is looking at the divine and the dichotomy between darkness and light, and light arriving on the scene when Van Gogh's self-portrait sort of explodes. Um, I wasn't sure whether you, in, in what way as whether the divine is still there in Van Gogh, in the same way in which it is in, in Dürer or Rembrandt, whether he's looking at himself with that idea of looking at a work of God, or whether there's something has changed um, in the process. And there's something's changed. And, the, uh, and it's, I think, in his eyes. Uh, but I was being, I, I, I've given a very, very summary lecture, as you realize, skating over things. Uh, the, um, You mustn't, I mean, how can I start to talk about this? Um, yes, he's, he, Van Gogh rediscovered spirituality. That's what his life was really about, in art. He gave up being a priest. He gave up his dedication to his faith. He gave up conventional religion. But he never lost a, a fantastic belief in divinity, in spirituality, in the broadest sense. And you can, we can discuss a great deal how much he was a Christian and all these things in his life. But the fact is that he's great, fantastic uh, uh, vision, uh, journey, really, blazing journey, was to reassert spirituality in the, in the whole of our lives. And the, you don't, don't be deceived by all this propaganda the modernists uh, give out that Van Gogh was rejected by the public. He never was. He was rejected by some of his fellow artists. He, when he, uh, the public never saw it. And when he began to show, he, the second time he showed, he got a fantastic review by Albert Oreo, who said, this is a work of genius. He wrote his brother saying, I cannot take it. Please tell Mr. Oreo not to write any more about me. And he committed suicide shortly after. And the director of the Van Gogh Museum he agrees with me. He said, yes, you're right. Van Gogh committed suicide after his first good review. He was painting. He was painting for the postman. He was painting for the peasant. He was painting for people he wanted to paint for. He didn't want to paint. He was painting in these very strong colors. But not just because they were the colors of popular popular woodcuts because they were visionary about spirituality. And when the public saw it, they, they, they loved it. He became amazingly famous. And the National Gallery bought one of his paintings 35 years after it had been made. Bought the yellow chair 35. That's when the National Gallery was still buying paintings before they gave up and abandoned the art of painting in that horrible, horrible action of Neil McGregor in, in 2000. Anyway, the, but, uh, why am I telling you this? I'm getting distracted. Uh, the, no, it is different because he's actually coming from the end of the Enlightenment. I mean, he is fantastically widely read and he knew what the scientists were all saying. And he just said, 
I'm going to fight all this. And, he res and his art is a fantastic resistance to it, to uh, the materialization of culture. And that's why the general public just loved it. It was like, and the people who wept when they saw Millet's Angelus loved, loved this because it, this was the same tradition. This was when peasants put down all their tools immediately the sun set, everyone laid down their tools. E everyone all over the world laid down their tools when the sun set because you prayed when the sun set. And that's what that painting was about. And, and Van Gogh was saying that is still valid. So that hasn't answered your question, has it? No, but it was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> You were talking about darkness and the Enlightenment and this uh, sort of unique relationship. But I was also thinking about darkness and spirituality, and I wondered what you, and the idea of the dark night of the soul. And uh, I was thinking of a line by the poet Henry Vaughan there is in God, some say, a deep but dazzling darkness. So I, I felt there was something about uh, you know, darkness and spirituality as well as darkness and the Enlightenment. I, I wondered what you thought well, about that. Uh, it... This is another huge subject. Um, the, but how can I say anything sensible about that? I mean, um, Newton at the end of his life, because that famous quote, which I now can't quote about the end of sea of, you know, you, you'll remember it, but darkness and, the, the, uh, and Pascal and all these figures are, uh, are discovering, and, and I, I can quote Van Gogh again, you know, when all sounds cease, the voice of God can be heard under the stars. And it's dark under the stars. So there was a, a lot of the, of the spirituality of darkness is part of the history of the Enlightenment. And the, uh, but uh, in other cultures, um, this is a, I, I, I can't answer, I can't answer this question now, but I would be very happy to talk about it. I'm sorry, I'm, f I'm fading now. Thank you very much.